I'll quickly introduce these uh, gentlemen. Um, we have, uh, let's start with the youngest, uh, a real case, ladies and gentlemen, from a Finvera pitcher, uh, Mr. William Wolfram from uh, Dildash. Uh, you will be able to introduce a little bit about yourself later on. Then we have a serial entrepreneur, uh, Willy Miettinen, from Microtask, uh, also been active in LOTS, uh, one of the big o investing companies. And then we have business angel Ari Korhonen, who's yeah, one of the most experienced angels here, as, as we know so far. So uh, without further ado, we're going to talk about what is a great startup team. And, and we got into this topic uh, from the question by you as an audience. That, that, that Everybody always said, let's invest in the best company uh, uh, with the best team and the possibility to scale. And uh, the problem is that well, what is a great startup team? So, so we have a few topics here. Hopefully, I will be quiet and you will do the talking. So uh, I will, yeah. Let's have an interactive discussion. So we'll start with having Ari Gorhan and present a little bit about yourself and, and, and your experiences as uh, the your experiences from uh, angel investing and, and startup teams. Okay, my name is Ari Gorhan and I'm an angel investor, full-time angel investor, already six and a half years. Most of you know the, my story. Uh, I was entrepreneur before that, and my company was bought by the bigger software integrator. Of course. If we talk about the teams, teams and how how entrepreneurs should uh, attract angel at the first place, everything starts from the first contact. Quite often, it has has been the pitching session, like today, for us to, with other other uh, these presenting entrepreneurs. So, for example, when I I was seeing William to pitch first time, it was uh, immediately I I understood that the guy is very. Uh, very bright and very, very, uh, let's say, impressive and fantastic pitcher. So it's, it raised the interest that there might be something. Of course, I didn't understand everything 50% because he's speaking so fluent English and quickly. So I was, I couldn't follow everything. And same continued in the meetings, of course, also. That. <laughs> but but any, anyhow, I got impressed and, and uh, William, William's company is one of the 21 companies I have invested in. But I think we have a possibility to share more later. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Willy Miettinen. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been building various tech companies for the last uh, 19 years now. Uh, also an angel investor in some of the startups uh, over here in Finland. And I do also, in my free time, uh, uh, a lot of accelerator and mentoring work at Startup Sauna, uh, Game Founders, Hack Forward, and a bunch of other uh, accelerators. Uh, I think I could start by saying what makes a great tech startup team is that basically you need three people, three guys or girls. You need a rock star CEO, you need a propeller head CTO, and you need a slick weasel. So you need a really good <laughs> sales guy. And in some very rare cases, you actually can get away with two people. So someone is actually a rock star CEO slash uh, propeller head CTO. And in some extremely rare cases, that can happen all in one person. But those are so rare that I don't, I don't think we even need to discuss those. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll pass over to uh, William, because I think you're at least two of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. But um, my name is William. I've been an entrepreneur for pretty much as long as I remember, which isn't very long. And um, it's funny to be here, because four years ago, I was at the exact same event and I was pitching Deal Dash for the first time publicly. Um, and that's where I met Ari Korhonen. And Ari invested in our company after that and joined the board. So it's, it's been a very interesting four years, and it's great to be back here. Could you shortly, William, describe your company, what it does for those who don't know, and, and quickly about the, the team? What was the situation from the beginning when you came to the pitch and how it's developed since then? Sure. So Deal Dash is a pay-to-play auction provider in, in the U.S., um, we're a Finnish company, but all of our revenue is from the U.S. We sell consumer electronics, kitchen appliances, video games, toys to about 2.4 million you know, U.S. shoppers. And um, I think at the time when we came here and, and I pitched, we were three people in the team. And we had a just below $1 million in annualized revenue run rate. And now we're just below $100 million in annualized run rate, um, very much thanks to the help from the board and, and the investment that made it possible. Okay, and the roles of these three entrepreneurs that time? <laughs> the 
would you like to describe? Did it match what Vilitas just mentioned? Um, yeah, we had a we had a really a lot of luck finding the right people, but I think you know a startup is like a band where you don't want everyone playing the same instrument. So we happened to find people that complemented each other's personalities and each other's strengths and weaknesses very well. So um, our VP of product is very different in a very positive way from myself. And when we worked together, we were able to accomplish so much more. Okay. So Ari, how did you experience after hearing William's pitch and, and meeting the, the, the gang for the first time? So what was your experience? What, what made them a good team? Yeah, I, I remember I went to Innopoli after this pitching, pitching session and there was actually three guys. Guys, I, I remember Larry, Larry, VP of product nowadays. He, uh, and of course, William was the third guy. I don't actually remember if I never never met before investment or then I maybe have forgotten it. But I remember Larry, that Larry was really long hair and 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 uh, VP of sales that time, I think so. And and of course, using jeans and, and uh, very young also like William. So And, and the best reverence, he, he was told that he made some social media things to one band in Finland, very famous band. I, I, I hardly ever have heard about that band even because I was I was so much older than these guys. And what was the band name? Lottie managed the social media for Children of Bottom, so he, he had experience <laughs> uh, going on the tour buses and <laughs> stuff like that. So it was an interesting mix. Yeah, okay. I didn't remember even now the band. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> the tour buses thing, so... <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so, so William made a really good presentation once again in a, in a company, we went through it, we went the financing round through and we, I met this Larry, VP sales, long-haired guy, and, uh, and uh, then quite quickly Finvera was involved in the, in the round and Vin, Finvera, Hannu Jungman was very positive to go in a round, to invest in a round, so investment was done. Sort of, sort of. I think in the two months or so, or one or two months in the, after the pitch. Coming what, what Willy here said, it's really important to in a team that there is a complementing competencies, that they are not the same guys from the kindergarten to the university, technical university, and all doing coding, but there's complementing competencies. That's a really important thing. Let's uh, just start quickly about the, let's peer into the, the deal dash case and then take part from there. So so what did you, you said the, the positive elements about the team and if you compare that to, you said you already men, met several good entrepreneurs and teams which haven't succeeded. So what, was there something special in this team that uh, was different? What, what was their, their added value? I, I think there was a really strong commitment and really strong, strong uh, sort of force that I felt that from William that he, he will really can go through and has a big commitment, commitment to be succeed, successful, not to sort of give up in the first corner or, or so. So the execution is, of course, it's 90% of the whole business. That's really, really important that the team is that kind of, an entrepreneur is that kind of, who really wants to go through and really make the growth company. And, and then when you can believe it, believe on that, then you can invest. Okay. And did you have any tests that you you tested? Can they deliver the the team and in the early phase? How how alpha was? That? Actually, actually, that was just like that. The traction went all the time up. I think always when the financing round is coming, William has been a master <laughs> on on boosting the boosting the uh, traffic. Even the traffic is all the time very good, but especially. That time I remember it was going up. During even the time period was quite short, maybe two months, but you, you could see development during that time. Okay, and since the investment, how the, the team has developed and, and what's the situation, what's the team size, if William you could answer, and, and uh, what were the, the lacking skills which you were able to, to get? So describe your team at the moment. So we're about 50 people today, most of us here in Helsinki. We also have an office in Minneapolis and, and New York City. Um, I think the big thing that we lacked early on was uh, a strong technical co-founder. So we ended up kind of building it um, not to scale from a technical standpoint. So we had to redo the entire software architecture once we hit 3,000 users. Okay. And uh, that, was a, that was a nightmare situation to get into. But 
over time, we've been very lucky finding very strong engineers to join the team. Um, and uh, I Was think that that's in Finland? Finnish engineers? Finnish engineers, yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. So can I ask a question from Ari? How come you invested into these guys in a situation where there wasn't a strong technical co-founder in the team? I would have never done that. So. <laughs> Good question. I passed this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess, you know, as, as a consumer internet company, we're not really a tech-driven company as much as um, some other companies are. So it, it was necessary, but it wasn't the uh, the most important part um, of our success. Okay. Well, Vili, uh, uh, you've seen a little bit of deal dash development as well, and you have a lot of experience from the abroad. So so what, could you somehow compare the, the typical Finnish startup compared to deal dash, and then again compared to, for example, Silicon Valley companies. So, so what, what would you see the, the lackings in, a, in the Finnish startup teams, most of as you've been coaching at Startup Sauna? And yeah, I mean, Deal Dash isn't a Finnish startup yeah, in the traditional sense. I mean, you resemble a Silicon Valley startup much more than uh, most of the startups over here. I mean, like, typically, I mean, it's always said that what we're lacking here in Finland are the sales and uh, marketing skills. And that's, I guess, also why we spend so much time and energy on pitching and pitching competitions and things like that because we identified, I mean, as a community, as a startup community, that this was a big weakness, I mean, like three, four years ago. And I think we are, if, if you're looking at the quality uh, of pitches uh, these days uh, in, in Finnish uh, events, I mean, we, we don't need to do that anymore. I mean, we, we've already got, gotten past that, but I think we still need some, some like serious uh, B2B sales and B2B marketing skills, and uh, we don't have that many um, experienced people around here. And this is obviously what Williams has been able to develop and nurture within the company and also attract great talent in that area. Very good. Okay, well, uh, we're going to focus more on, and uh, Deal Dash is a great example, but uh, we gathered some questions more specific what comes to startup teams, but feel free to raise your hand or shout and uh, interrupt, so if you have some more specific questions. Any questions so far to any one of the gentlemen? Okay, so we, we gathered some of the questions uh, uh, on this part. Um, what to consider when adding team members to fulfill the founders? So, so uh, as Ari, you mentioned, wh when you have a team, and, and as Deal Dash has really has been developed up to 50, 50, mem uh, 50 team members, what, what are elements which you uh, see that, that should be uh, uh, somehow noticed for, for the original three members who were there? And, and, and what, for example, if some of the founding members don't deliver, so, so what's the process of, for example, in the worst case, getting rid of it or, or implementing more? So what's your experience on that part? Yeah, talking talking general, uh, not uh, not for deal dash case, but of course there comes time that, that you need different kind of uh, skill set than in the start of the, co when, when company is starting. So first you need certain type of skill skill stuff later on when there's a 50 people we need more diff another type of the skills so so that that's why team cannot be the same all the time it, it's natural that it changes change uh, by time from the need of the company and for example there comes like you said marketing marketing or cfo comes in some moment if not in the start normally but then when there's 15, 20 people, CFO comes in, then then there comes other other type of, in, uh, and when the company is in the international market, and you you maybe put subsidiary to US or UK, you need people there, so it's totally different yeah. setup after that. And, and how do you prepare from the when going into deal with Deal Dash? What how do you prepare? Is it the papers or how do you? prepare the founders that we're going to have to maybe change some of the original founders or, or, or how do you prepare that? What, what's it's not in the papers, but of course it's a, from investor really good question before doing the investment that what founders are thinking about that, that how we should develop the team and what kind of lacking competencies there is in the team and, and, and the difficult question should be also made that what if you are not anymore CEO after two years, is it okay for you if you're sort of technical uh, technical founder, for example, and starting with the t CEO, so that this kind of things should be discussed open, that there's no disappointments or misunderstandings in the future, because in quite many cases,
there comes a time if there's, a, for example, technical CEO, it, there might come a time to need to have an external CEO. Yeah, I think there is also another big question that the founders should realize in the beginning is that uh, I think that switching your roles within the company, let's say CEO stepping down and moving over to VP of product or something like that is, is a lesser issue, but a much bigger issue is the equity. Uh, the equity split uh, amongst the founders. Uh, what happens if someone's leaving the company uh, or is forced to leave the company at some point? And this is something that the founders need to nail down at the very beginning, like way before there is any uh, angel money on the table. It shouldn't be the first investors who draft this kind of a shareholders agreement. It has to be among the founders because I mean, I've seen it many times, especially if you have multiple founders, that the situations change, their life situations change, they get family, they get other interests, uh, and the, the amount of work they're able to put into the company is not equal, even though Finns are usually very democratic and they think that an equal uh, equity split in the beginning is the right way to go, it's totally wrong. I mean, it, it's people are never equal uh, in that sense. And uh, th this is one of the things that can actually make or break a company uh, big time. So the, one of the minimum things I, I really want to see uh, when the founders put together their first uh, shareholders agreement is to have at least some kind of a vesting uh, agreement there so that there is a, a pre-agreed set of rules what to do with the equity if someone needs to leave. Yeah, that's a really important point to have this kind of vesting that you're still, founder normally, normally thinks that he has already these shares, why these existing shares should somehow vest. He, he or she already has those, but when if we make a bigger investment, we should put some vesting, so-called so bad lever clauses that if, if founder is leaving, he lose. His, his or her shares and maybe vest him time by time. Yeah. It's a really important point. Can I add just one more thing? Um, and then also in Finland, due to the tax laws we have here, I mean, there is this bit of an how's it, upstairs, downstairs kind of a, a situation between founders of a company. So those who receive equity in the very beginning and those who join in later, especially after the first angel round, after the company has been valued, um, those are usually compensated with stock options. And there is a huge difference between these uh, two groups of people uh, in, um, in financial terms. So that's also very crucial when deciding at the very beginning who are actually going to be the founders of the company. And does that group have sufficient talent to, uh, to push the company onwards? And it is really important, especially if the company goes through very hard times. I mean, it's so hard times that, uh, let's say, the investors are not willing to invest anymore into the company. It's, it really all boils down back to the founders. They have to make the calls, they have to decide whether they want to put in their own money or so forth. So that really separates founders from uh, investors or regular employees. Okay. Uh, William, hearing these comments when receiving the, the investment from Ari, uh, wh wh how did you see that? Did you uh, consider, did you know this already or did Ari bring this kind of information? How did it feel? and, and, and how did the process go? Did you? Well, we had a really serious chat about you know what I wanted to do in the company, and and I think it was important to have that discussion before, um, you know, we we with we, Ari with Ari, yeah, yes, and uh, you know we we managed to get the board together. So when Hanno Jungman invested from Finnvera, mm -hmm. then you know he he and Mikko Suonalahti uh, then joined the board, and then they introduced us to Ari introduced us to to Temu Aho, who's here today, and and to Spin Top and. And Mikko introduced me to uh, uh, David Friend, who's a serial entrepreneur in, in Boston, who mm. he'd invested in. Um, so we just managed to get the right people also on the board and to, to kind of mentor me through the process of growing as a CEO. And one thing I've realized is that the founding team is very different today than, it, well, you know, the, the things we do are very different today than the things we did three years ago or even last year. And if you're unwilling to change, and sometimes that means changing people, then uh, you're kind of stifling your own company's growth. Okay. So the CEO role and the, and the founder's roles must continue to evolve or then you must change people. So was it within your team that you got the responsibility to decide that you, you had the responsibility and the team members, the two others from the original founders, they, they were happy with their position. They, there wasn't any argument in, in that part. And 
Well, in the beginning, there was just so much work to get done that we didn't even think about. You okay. know, someone had to, you know, make the coffee because we had Ari coming over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> someone had to, you know, respond to customer service emails, and we had to ship the products out to people. So, but as the company grew and we, we were able to hire a few more people, um, the roles have changed. Even even kind of the core management team, the roles are constantly changing. Yeah. And sometimes people are hesitant to that change, but then you have to explain that the company is five times the size. It was when you came into this role, and the skills needed have changed. And you know, and nowadays we're trying to forecast that. What do you need to get good at now, so that a year from now, when the company looks very different, that you can still remain in your position and be relevant? Okay, good. Yeah, you got to keep in mind that when you hire a person to a company, I mean, you usually hire them for a role, and you agree in advance what that person, uh, what the title is going to be, and at what roughly their job description is and, and so forth. I mean, the founders, they got to do whatever they got to do. I mean, I spent yesterday 12 hours coding in C. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I have a, if, are you okay? Uh, yeah, uh, just a quick, because one of the reasons why we took this panel was, is Tapio Heikkila here? Hands up. Yeah, you were the one that once mentioned that, that everybody talks about a great startup team, but what is it actually? So do you have any comments so far when you heard the discussions here? Anything you would like to, from your experience, to, to bring up? <laughs> I think we should give an applause to, yeah. We can just repeat the question. So, uh, so what were the first of all, congratulations for not making investment and, and you no no not for other making investment you succeeding. But anyway, so what were the three things you would have done differently or or? Well, there are a lot of mistakes that you know we we do differently if we did it again. I think um, for biggest mistake probably relates to people. You know, we've even though we're very aware that the roles need to change. I think we weren't fast enough in making and implementing those changes. So because you get very close to people in a startup, it's easy, you know, became very good friends and it's important to still kind of be very open and candid about here's what the role requires and here's what we have today and, and then, you know, making those changes and having those discussions. Nowadays, I'd like to think we're much better at that and we're proactively doing it. That, that, that sounds really hard to, to know. So would you wish that Ari would have been more proactive in, 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 in implementing those thoughts or...? or no, but he was. I mean, he, he, he and the rest of the board have been very good in terms of pushing us in that direction where they're challenging me to think about who are the right people for this role, who do we need to hire next, and, and just being open to that change that, you know, you, you try one structure and someone does this, and then you, you, know, you look at a trial period or you look at a few months and then you might have to make an adjustment. So that's probably the biggest mistake, just being too slow and changing people in different roles. Um, other mistakes we've done is just lack of focus. So we've had so many opportunities and things that we could have done, um, and it's very tempting to do, but you know we've been able to, over time, try to focus, first of all, only in the US market. So we've decided not to go um, into a number of other geographical markets. But then also kind of focusing on um, Product opportunities and focusing on, 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 you know, merchandising opportunities. So I think we, that's the second biggest mistake we made was that we weren't focused enough, and we probably still aren't focused enough. Um, so that's the second biggest mistake, and probably uh, third biggest mistake, just very specific one in a consumer internet company. It's very easy to look at KPIs like number of registered users and try to grow that number. It was only until we realized that all the customers weren't created equal, and there was a, a pocket of customers that were um, 
going to be around for years and years and love the service, and there's a pocket of customers, a much larger group, that was only going to try once or twice and go away. And when we realized that, we made an active trade-off in the decision that we're not going to be everything for everyone, but we're going to be the best we can for this group. And, uh, and that, that shift in thinking um, made the company go from burning cash to cash flow positive. Okay. Very good. Very good. good comments. Uh, any comments from that part? Uh, are you agree that uh, th those are the three three seen from the outside? But sure, there are many, many more mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, any more comments or there's a question. I'll just repeat the question. So, should all the, the should everyone in the management team have a stake in the company? Exactly. Yes. Very good. <laughs> Any additional comments on that? Any agree disagreements? Yeah, the uh, owners and the management team should have a uh, in, in this kind of aligned uh, incentives. So that's why it's really important. Is, is it then? A, uh, shares, or, or it can be an option, pro option program also. But I think it's good to good to have it like that. But to think about my portfolio companies, it's not like that in every every company. Uh, I have a slightly different point of view. I think it's very individual in how people value equity. We tend to give people the option between cash and equity, and you know, if people choose cash, then. Um, it, it kind of shows how they think about it, or they just might need the cash at that time, but. Um, I think a lot of uh, kind of real value has gone to waste if you just throw equity at people that don't think about equity and value it in the same way. You might as well, you know, sell a bit more equity out to investors and and pay higher salaries. We've done both. Yeah, but we're here discussing the management team, which shouldn't be that big. I mean, how, how big is your management team? Like four people? Seven people. Seven people. Okay. Still, I think they should all have some stakes in the company. I think it's, it's individual. So some people um, choose to work for equity and they value that. And other people, they don't know if they have 100 options or 1,000 options. They don't care. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's a big mistake to throw, throw equity at everyone. OK. Good. Well, good comments. And we're forwarding getting to the end part. If, we'll just, if it's OK, we'll, we'll have a, from Ari one more, more specific question that, that we mentioned the three mistakes which we would uh, like to have been reconsider or, or done better. So Ari, for you as being experienced from making successful investments and, and less successful, so what, what would you see as when thinking about the startup team? What, what are elements which you really would recommend things to, to be thought of before making an investment? <clears throat> I think there's many things, uh, lesson learned. Uh, one thing is maybe arrogance. If the team is or some persons from the team are too arrogant, that so, sort of mentality that I, I know everything, I only need money. So that's, the, that's a turn off, let's say, for, for my side, at, at least one, one really important thing that sort of the team is sort of, I don't mean that everything, what we angels say, that it's, it's right and uh, must be done, but sort of that the entrepreneur team is listening at least, coachable, sort of coachable, not, not too arrogant. That's one. Okay. And, yeah. and I, I would guess I'm personally both when building companies and also when I've been advising or investing in them, I'm really looking at the team dynamics. So how does the founder team get together? Because these guys are going to be together most likely for the next six years, seven years, uh, whatever, and they're going to be together uh, in some very difficult situations. So it's uh, if there's a very obvious like conflict, like conflicts between the, the people, like they're, well, I mean, the dynamics are bad, then it's not going to fly. Very good. Oh, uh, feel like commenting or? or I have nothing to add okay. to this point. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to finalize this panel quickly. Just uh, uh, definitely uh, the, the, what from comes from Ari's point of view, which you said in the very early phase, you only invest in a company in which the, the team is such a good team that you can spend two hours in an elevator every day for the next 10 years. So, so I guess that's one of the starting points. But let, let's have the one last question. Okay. Yeah, so I, I want to ask Miriam about your choice. So you give, you give choice to your management team members uh, to choose between cash and startup equity. 
Yeah, we, we had the luxury to do that, so. Well, I, I think the there are question? three things at play. So, really, repeat the question, just for the. Have we ever questioned the, the the motives of an employee who chooses cash over stock? Yeah. Sure, but I, I think there are three things at play. The first one is it's cultural, and 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 when we hire American team members, they tend to be much more equity focused. They say, "I'd rather we get paid twenty percent less." But what are the stock options available? Um, young t Finnish team members aren't as pushy on the equity side. Uh, the other other thing is. Uh, there's something that happens when you give people that choice. If you give, if you just say we're going to give everyone this much equity, they just take it for advantage and that's it. When you say you have to choose between getting paid more in cash or taking a slightly, you know, smaller salary but getting equity, when they go home and they discuss that with their family members and they come back the next day and they say I chose equity, then they're committed. Then they then they have ownership. They've made a trade off and they own it. If you just give it to them, people start taking. Uh, they look at it maybe differently than if they make that active decision. So I think it's also kind of a useful way to give equity out is for people to make that decision themselves. Um, and then, you know, it's it's the third option is you don't always have that luxury of being able to pay cash. Uh, we were very lucky in the sense that we got the investment round in and then we could kind of sit down with the board and think about this. But uh, if you don't have the option, then you, I guess you're, you're forced to, to pay equity. Very good. I think that's most of our time for this panel. So, so once again, thanks for participating. We're going to now go over to the uh, shortly angel news and then some pitching and hopefully offer William some flashbacks from a few years ago. So, so thank you. Let's give a big applause to the panelists.